nightmares, the incidents that repeat themselves every night you go to sleep, you got enemies waking you up that are dead, people knocking on your door that are dead and like and it's vivid. People asking you questions like why, why, why? And you're like waking up thinking, what the fuck? So now I can kill him. <clears throat> so then I've stabbed him about 12, 14 times. He knew he should have threw that phone away. He knew that phone would have linked me to him. He knew I would have been nicked. He knows that. Anyone would. There was a little commotion and then he ended up with two compound fractures where both his shin bone popped out of his shins. He shot me and he shot me and he shot me and then walked over to me and shot me twice in the face. So I was smoking crack, taking ease, drinking and sniffing with my mum at the age of 13 years of age. I used to bug up my cars, I used to bug up my houses, and I used to video everything. I said, take one more fucking step towards me, and you'll see how real this fucking thing is, you cheeky cunt. Yeah, I wanted to be an armed robber from nine years of age. From the day you walk in there, because you know, I'd watch scum Where's your top? and things like that. What I sort of worked out what I've got to do. And where I weren't a shook member, I was always game to fight. So for me, fighting was just an escape. Because I only went football for ag and violence. I never went football for football. So people that know me know I wasn't a football fan. I just come for ag. Yeah, even my friends, I've, I've, some of my friends have been shot, some of my friends have been stabbed, and some of my friends have been beaten up. But that's because they broke the rules. So I smashed his teeth in. So I mean, I said, speed the fucking car up. He's put his foot down, I just threw him out of the car. Open the doors, as I've opened the doors, boom. And it was like, a white flash. Bang, he's hit me with it again. Did you just fucking hit me with that? Bang, he's hit me with it again. And that's why a lot of people turn to drink and drugs, because they can't handle the demons. And the demons are what used to push me towards more badness. Joined by Marvin Herbert today. Marvin, thank you very much for coming here today. My and pleasure, my pleasure. Marvin's got the most incredible story. I'm sure you guys have been seeing it's been going viral over the last couple of months on YouTube on platforms such as James English and Sean Atwood and the most incredible monumental rise from the depths of the criminal world into, well, the pinnacle of the criminal world, which is the depths of society into the conventional, back into the normal world. And uh, congratulations on your rise. It's been a journey, man, it's been a journey. Um, yeah, it's just, I'll let you prompt me where you Perfect. want me to talk and where you want me to start, because it's just a journey that's just full of everything, really. So it's what you want to cover, where you want to start, where you want to go. Well, perfect. Like I said yours. a minute ago, you said um, you were destined to be the man you were. And so I want to look back at your childhood and see what created and sculpted you to be destined for that path, if possible. And okay. then we can maybe try and look at children who are on that same path and then put tools in to engineer them so they didn't have to go down the quite treacherous road that you did at certain points of your life. So talk to me, whereabouts were you born, Marvin? Um, Liverpool. I was born in Liverpool, 1972, in Fazakley Hospital. Um, I haven't got many memories of Liverpool, but the vague memories I do have will give you a brief outline of the sort of living. Like, in Liverpool, everything was fine. When I, um, the, the, my, my first memories of growing up was like unbelievable. So I've got no real trauma. I remember getting run over at four years of age. I remember falling on a bottle at 18 months age. So 18 months of age, I've got a scar. I'll show you that scar so you can show it up. I, got, I fell on a bottle and went right through my leg. But I actually remember, remember seeing the bottle, thinking, oh my, oh my God. I remember going to the hospital I remember the doctor pulling it out. I remember the injection had to give me in the cut, you know. So my memories of trauma go back to 18 months of age. But my memories of Liverpool are very fond. It was a, a lot of fun, a lot of games, a lot of running out, a lot of sort of child, happy, friendly sort of memories sort of as a child. I don't remember any 
violence or drugs or trauma. The only trauma I remember from Liverpool was um, the falling on the bottle, getting run over and leaving. So up until leaving, I had a pretty conventional life in Liverpool. Obviously everyone knows what Liverpool was like in the 70s. Everywhere was racist. Though. Racist was just my normal. And being called a nigger every day wasn't anything to sort of frown about. It would help sort of, I've helped distinguish the man I am today. I suppose it's, it's part of growing up in that world, you know. Um, so racism is something you got used to pretty quickly. Never really paid much attention to at that stage of my life. Um, I remember playing out over the cathedral because we lived on Brownlow Hill facing the, the new cathedral. I used to live in the ball ring. Well, I lived next to the ball ring. The ball ring was a, 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 an estate and then I lived in the masonettes on, ball, on um, Brownlow Hill which backed onto the ball ring. Um, my last memory of Liverpool, and I put it out there a couple of times, with Christopher Hatton. So I really, really, I don't know why, but I really, 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 really want to meet Christopher Hatton now. Like, not for any other reason, but just he's the last memory I have. That's the last fight I had in Liverpool when I was about seven years of age. I remember Ginger Christopher Hatton in the ball ring. I had to go down there and fight with him over a girl we was fighting over. But I'd just like to have a conversation. That's my last memory of Liverpool. And it's always stuck in my mind, you know what I'm saying? But, um, and then I got run over coming out. But I went to Pleasant Street School. Um, I went to a Sunday school. I got run over coming out of that. Ended up in Older Hay Hospital for a few months with tractions on my leg. Um, I remember going over to Crockstuff, um, Norris Green, where my, aunt, where my nan, granddad, and auntie's and uncles lived. And then Kenny, Granby, like this is where my uncles, my cousins, and the rest of my extended family lived. Like my mum's family was from Crockstuff, my dad's family was from Tockstuff, well, Liverpool way. Um, so the mixed race family was Chalkstuff and the white family and people that know Liverpool know it's divided that way. So Chalkstuff was white, racist um, and LA was multicultural and anti-racist. So I was brought up with the best of both worlds for Liverpool. Obviously my nan and my granddad and my auntie and my uncle was all workers. They all had businesses. Me and nan and granddad run the local community centre called The Gems. Um, all my uncles worked, there was all law by decision, but one, and um, one of them was an armed robber. And I um, went on to do other things in life and then turned his life around as well. That was my uncle Gerard. Um, but the rest of the family on the whole was pretty decent. Well, they were decent, normal, everyday working folk. They weren't egotistical, angry, violent. They was just normal, everyday, getting up, going to work, looking after the kids and all the kids, all my cousins are really well balanced. Um, I have one cousin that is not as balanced as the rest, but they haven't made any catastrophic moves towards a criminal fraternity. Mm. You know, they're, they're all law binding straight going people that live a decent life, normality, go through the trials and tribulations of normal people. Um, I came to London. But real quickly before that, was your dad present in those first seven years of your life? Was he yeah, around a lot? Yeah. And obviously he was a criminal, wasn't he? Did you know this? When did you realise your dad was a criminal? I never, you know, I never really realised what my dad was until later on in my adolescence. It, like, my dad was just a voice. My dad was just f fear. My dad was just a threat. My dad was just fun. So it was just, if you was naughty, you knew you were in trouble. And when my dad come home, you're getting it. When my dad turned up, we was having fun. Do you know what I mean? There was always money about. There was mm. always things to do. We was always going somewhere. My dad was always active. So I always wanted to be with, with my dad. I wanted to go out everywhere with my dad. My dad was like the, the life and soul of the party. Where he went, he got a lot of attention. What he'd done, he got a lot of attention by doing. So I spent a lot of time trying to be with my dad everywhere, you know, but not being successful. Okay. And um, so what made your family move from Liverpool all the way to London at seven years old? Do you know the reasons why your mum moved down there or parents yeah. moved there? Well, basically, I've only sort of worked this out over the period of time. Basically, what it was, um, my dad was a prolific criminal. He was arrested in the 70s. I can't remember what year it was for um, armed robbery. And we went away with a couple of prolific people from Liverpool. Um, 
and they got five years on something else for a robbery or an armed robbery. Um, and then basically, I don't know if it's true, but this is what I believe. Right? So you asked me why I'm going to be moved, and I believe this is why we moved. And my dad didn't like doing the five year sentence that he'd done, and he wanted a change. So basically, when he was away, I believe that his two co defendants he was arrested with made links while they was in prison to make connections with a with a, um, the Class A connection of the criminal fraternity. My dad was always into weed and snooker, gambling and violence and guns and stuff like that. But I think after that sentence, because he was a pretty model prisoner, I was told. So he was a model prisoner, he, he played the game, got out. So when he come out, he didn't want to go back to that life. So he decided to not do the robberies anymore and he's just going to focus on weed. Um, his two partners that he worked with at that stage, I believe, got into the class A's because later in life they did get arrested um, for large quantities of uh, cocaine, one being a couple of tonne, one being half a tonne and one being a few hundred bits. So um, he came to London. What my dad was known for was sensimenia and commercial weed. So sensimenia weed, my dad had a a big stronghold in, in North West London, East London and West London. Um, and I know this by the relationships I built with people growing up over the years. Like my dad was the guy that everybody got their cess from mm. and everyone spoke very highly of my dad growing up. So I sort of worked out in my adolescence that my dad was the weed man. Um, and when Real quickly to pause, you know, do you think getting moved from Liverpool to London at seven years old was another factor that maybe sculptured because Getting a kid taken out of their setting with all their friends and all their family, you said you had a lot of family in Liverpool, getting moved to London and then being the guy, the kid with the funny accent and all this sort of stuff. You don't think this was any sort of factor or made you slightly... Uh, well, I can't answer that because... Can't remember. Well, do you know what it is? I remember what made me be a criminal. Mm. So it weren't really the environment that made me be a criminal. It was more about my dad that made me be a criminal. Uh, it, it's not an excuse, but it was, it was just, I wanted to be the opposite of my dad. That was all I ever wanted to be, the opposite of my dad. And then, how can I be the opposite of my dad? So then I had to look for other avenues to become the opposite of my dad. And I found out that armed robbery, violent crimes, and that sort of gangsterism, that gangsterized mindset or environment is what excited me. Mm. My dad wasn't a gangster's man, like he wasn't, he didn't want to be that guy. He was just that guy. So everybody knew my dad for a week, but he didn't want to be, my dad didn't want to be the biggest or the baddest. He, did, he just wanted to get by. He was mm. one of them guys, he was just everyone's friend, where I was no one's friend. And mm. I had business associates, and I had people that had a job to do. When I was a criminal, um, if you had no job to do, you had no value. So my dad's relationships and my relationships were totally different. And I was just the total polar opposite of my dad. So my dad had friendships with people and he grafted, worked the world, hustled and done what he'd done. Where I absolutely wanted to be a criminal. From what age? Nine years of age. Fucking hell. Yeah, I wanted to be an armed robber from nine years of age. Oh my God. I remember being, I remember saying I want to be an armed robber. I want to be an armed robber. I want to be an armed robber. That's what I want to be. I don't want to be anything else. And then basically, how can I become an armed robber? Then I need to know how to do everything. So then I started stealing. Did you know any armed robbers at that stage or was that just watching it on TV and know that they're kind of the top of the top, the ones with the guns? Well, the my mate's dad, my mate's dad and my mate uncle. Um, so my mate was a guy called Barry Lydon. Barry and Tracy Lydon, real good close friends with. And uh, their dad and their uncle were prolific armed robbers and they went away for 17 and 20 years and things like that later in life, you know, like they was, there was the, the carte blanche. I mean, they, they, were, they, they, they were the, the creme de la creme of the, the, the underworld at that stage of my life, sort of thing. They were robbing the security vans. They was doing all the, like, they had all the equipment, all the house gear, like, all the... They were living all the, the material. Yeah, they, they had all the materialistic They had everything, mate. They had and everything. You were looking up to that and the sort of people they were and the way they yeah. held themselves. Yeah. And... So, effectively, they're the peer group that I, I, I gravitated towards growing up, you know. Um, Obviously, because my dad was into drugs and I never benefited, my family never benefited the way I imagined 
to benefit, I always looked at my dad as a failure. Do you know what I mean? I didn't realise then anything about life, <laughs> relationships. I didn't realise what type of woman, a woman my mum was, what type of a man my, my dad was. So, because of the mistrust in my mum and dad's relationship, my dad wouldn't leave my mum looking after money because my mum wasn't very good at looking after money. She spent a lot of money. Um, just to keep it simple, I was smoking crack, taking ease, drinking and sniffing with my mum at the age of 13 years of age. So I mean, like, I was actually providing my mum and my mum was selling my drugs, like puff. Like, who, who was giving 13 year old drugs? What do you mean I was selling it? Yeah, no, but who was giving you these drugs to sell? What sort of character was it? Older villains and they're yeah. giving... Like we were the, the, I know the age sounds seriously immature and premature and you think, how could you do that with a 13 year old? But we were different kids, mate. So, I mean, it was, it was, I don't, I don't get, I don't, I don't understand why people done what they'd done with us as kids, but it happened, mate. And it was just the type of people we were. You know, we had money, we had resources, and we had confidence, so. So you're 13 selling drugs with gangs at those times there? Did you got into the gang life? It's always, look, gangs, gangs are just a label what they put on everything, but it's just a group of people hanging about together, and that's what they call a gang. So that's been there from day one. Um, the first, gang that started all the serious crime off was the Untouchables. So we started the Untouchables in the 80s. Um, it was me, Maine, Hell, Rizla, Spotty, Tetley, Uni, um, Steam, Krez, And then we had state of the art with Bunny and all them lot as well. But it was just, there was, I can't remember everybody's tag, but there was the, the main untouchables was us lot. And then it grew out, spread into South London, and it sort of just died out a little bit. But when we started in the 80s and the 90s, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a different platform to what it became. You know, like we was just different, like, we were steaming, we were robbing in gangs, it was like, no train, no bus, no high street was safe. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's kind of embarrassing talking about it now, but it's, you get up in the morning, you have a couple of joints, you go and meet five or six of the kids, then you go down to Golden's Green, meet another four or five kids, hit the West End, West End, meet another five or seven kids. So you've got about 20, 30 kids with you, and then you just get on the train and just rob everybody on the train. Get on the bus and just rob everybody on the bus. Get off the bus and get on another train and just rob everybody on the train until you actually get chased by the police or get to your destination and then when you get to your destination you get off the train or the bus and you walk into a shop and you just rob the shop of all the alcohol rob the shop of all the snack rob the shops of all the snack and the money in the tills and then you go and sit down buy your bit of puff but and drink your alcohol smoke your weed i was the only one of our group sniffing cocaine back then but i used to love it sniffing coke and taking ease and just going out on mad ones all day do you know what i'm saying John? and you lot were uh, graffiti as well weren't you yeah graffiti my, my tag was smiley and what was the purpose of the graffiti? Is it kind of like a dog pissing on the corner, putting his scent down? Yeah. Is it kind of yeah, territorial? Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just the, the, the more places your tag is seen, the better artist you are. The more complicated the places you tag, the more sort of respectable your tag is. So if, it's a, if, if your tag's in a place where you can die to put it, then you're a bad man in the graffiti world. Mm. And that's what it's all about, getting your tag in the places where no one else can. That was the ultimate goal of tagging. Do you know what I mean? And then you do your pieces on the side of a train or on a building to let people know what area you're at. Or that we're bad enough to come here and put a piece on your wall. Mm. Do you know what I mean? How can I be here for two hours in your area and you're supposed to be a bad man? I've just put my piece on your wall, bro. How? Do you know what I mean? Or if you put a tag up, I tag over your tag. I spit on you. Do you know what I'm saying so that causes it out. <coughs> so there was a lot of... But it's like, I believe that the graffiti started a lot of postcode wars, postcode wars because that's what started segregating everybody. Because we used to hang about in really big groups of people. So the Untouchables was basically North London, West London, and East London. And we all used to meet up, and every now and then we'd get a couple of South Londoners, <coughs> and we'd just meet up and just go out tagging trains and then getting some food. <coughs> but getting food was just robbing 
anywhere we went to. Like anywhere you went, you know, go to McDonald's, you have a big order up and then just run out of it. Mm. Same thing in Kentucky. Do you know what I mean? Sit down in the restaurant, have a mad meal and then all just run out. Do you know what I mean? Like go in the pub, order drinks and then just run away from the bar. Go to the waffle ice and just rob all the drink. Do you know what I mean? Because we was untouchable and that mm. was just the mindset, you know? It was crazy times. So in those teenagers, talk to us about uh, the first arrest and your first contact with the police and stuff like this. Was that around those that was, times? That was before the gangs, all that. Yeah, I, I, my first arrest, I was 11. Um, basically, my older brothers and that used to go out nicking car stereos and my brother come in one day and he's asked me to go out of him. Because obviously the old lot want the younger lot to keep dog, which is to keep lookout, right? So he said, come and look, I need you to come and watch something. So he took me out to do something and then I've seen him throw a little white thing at a car window and it shattered the window without making any noise. And I was like, what did you just do then? And he was like, oh, it's a spark plug. I was like, what? Show me. So he showed me the white enamel part of a spark plug. It smashes the window quietly, right? And I was like, rah. So let me try that. So boom, and I've done it. I was like, wow, that's wicked. Yeah, so, I believe that. That's... Yeah, yeah, So basically, what was it? What you do, you do it on the window, it does it, whoop, shatters it instantly, right? Then what you do, you lean on the window, yeah? And just push it in. So what we learned to do at a later date was go up to the, like, when you're nicking the cars for the stuff, you go up to the car, you put masking tape on the window and then just shatter it and then just push it in and it just not, doesn't make any noise at all. Or if you don't put the masking tape on, what you hear is <laughs> and then people hear that and wake up and what's that noise? So you learn in time how to stop the, the noise. Mm -hmm. So the spark plug was out, you smash the windows quietly. So my first arrest was I've gone to school with a handful, a bag of spark plugs. So we've gone on dinner break now. So at lunchtime, we always go to Primo's Hill. We used to walk up Primo's Hill, smoking fads, joints, have it hanging about, and walk back to school, have a bit of, walk up to the chip shop, get the chip shit, go back to school. So on the way back, I've gone, here, who reckons? Boom, and they've gone, what's that? And I said, what's this? Boom, I've done the window, and I was like, rah! So I've done one window, and it's gone, because you do it hard enough, the whole window just shatters and falls, right? So I've done one window, everyone started running. So I'm then we're all running down the road, but I'm in front and I'm laughing my bollocks off. And as I'm running down the road, I'm doing every car I'm running past. Boom, and you can hear his alarms going off all the way down the road, right? So there's about eight or 10 of us all running down the road, gone back to school. Anyway, a couple of days later, we'll come out of school. I've walked over to Chalk Farm train station. We used to stay in the train station, we used to stand in the, in the phone boxes. Every train station used to have phone boxes in them, right? So we used to stand in the phone boxes smoking fags in the train station so the, screw, the teachers can't see or your mum and dad ain't driving past or whatever. So we're in there smoking a the fag. All of a sudden I'm standing there, about five old Bill walked in. So you, obviously you iron all the fags and they walked over, are you Marvin Mahoney? I was like, why? I said, are you Marvin Mahoney? I was like, yeah. They said, right, you're under arrest and they tried to grab me. But obviously in the 70s and 80s, there was a, there was a big hoot about nonces, child molesters, right? So. Any adult that used to touch a kid, we used to use as an excuse to freak out. So if an adult touched you, you could freak out and it would be sort of suffered because of all the social, the social element side of the, the care, like care orders and social services. Mm -hmm. like I learned young that when an adult touches you and you exaggerate, they get in trouble. So when the cousins come up to me, he's trying to nick me, I've just started screaming and shouting, but then they've tried to cover my mouth up. And, and I don't know what happened, but, I've been told I've got exceptional strength and I'm really powerful, but they tried to arrest me and it just turned into maybe, we come out of the station, down the road, the pavement, across the street, and then into a police van. Do you know what I mean? Like we were fighting for about 15 minutes and they was trying to get me in this van. It got to the point where two of the teachers had to come running out of school and jump in the police van with me and then went to the police station. I got done for, um, I think it was about eight or nine criminal damages and seven assaults on police officers. That was my first ever nicking. Do you know what I mean? And at that point there, when you were at the station, were you worried or excited and a bit buzzed up? I, mean, I was just angry, man. I wanted to fight, innit? They hurt me, innit? So I wanted yeah. to fucking hurt people. Because we met one of your friends um, about a month ago, Ambush, and he told us the first time he ever got nicked is his excitement for him, and then like when he go back, he I've been nicked, I've been spent time in the police station, and that was it. Nothing like that for you, was it? Was it like peer points with your? No, do you know what it was? It was a, it was a, a combination of emotions because 
I did know what I got arrested for, and then I got told what I got arrested for, and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I got told that all my mates made statements against me, apart from David Preston. And I put it out there, Dave, you're the only one who ever made a statement. David Preston was the only one out of all my mates from school who ever made a statement. Every other single person, I won't name them because we was all kids, but everyone who used to hang about me in Aberstock, they used to come over from Brazil, and you all know who you are, they all made statements against me. Do you know what I mean? And that, I thought, wankers. And that sort of got me on the, keep myself to myself, don't tell anybody anything, don't have people with you, because they're all scared of their mums, they're all scared of their dads. So that made me learn at that young age that don't let kids know what you're doing, because they'll tell. Mm. So that was what matured me more than anything coming out of that police cell, for these fucking wankers. Because I wasn't scared of my mum and dad, but because these kids, you better tell me the truth, and they tell their mum and dad, then they're, made, then they're made to tell the police. So mm. I learned from a very early age that you don't let no one know nothing, no matter who it is. What age did you end up going to Young Offenders? First time. And for what crime was it, Mark? Um, the Young Offenders was robbery. Was that train on we spoke about? That was robbing persons unknown of properties unknown. I got nine months for that, for robbing someone that they don't know who it was of something they didn't know what it was. So I robbed someone, they don't know who it was I robbed, and they don't know what I robbed, but I got nine months for it. Man, isn't it? And so the, the person didn't want to press charges, but the police just grabbed you because they knew you'd been involved. No, it was so part how of a, they no, do that? Because it's what I'm saying, it was part of a, it was, it was a steaming campaign. Mm. So because they knew it was part of the steaming crew, anytime steaming went on, we just got arrested for robbing persons unknowns or products unknowns. And it was just something they'd done to stop that sort of, Trend. It was a trend, wasn't it? It was in the early late eighties, early nineties. It was just a thing. Okay, so for people who don't know, tell us what steaming is. Steaming is when you got twenty-five young men and a couple of women. You get on the tube at the first carriage, and then you will walk through the train, robbing every single person on the train of their money, their watches, and their jackets, and even their trainers if they had nice trainers on. And that was what steaming was. And we done it on buses, we done it on trains, and we done it in cinemas as well. Hit the cinemas. And fun fairs. Fun fairs was a Southall fun fair. And I'll apologize now to any Asian people that lost their chains in Southall fair. Because we used to go over there, you know the dodgems? When they get on the dodgems, just jump on the dodgems, as if you work on the gap and just pop the chains off them. <laughs> and they wouldn't have what can they do? Just pop the chains off them. Big gags is all they give it, yeah! Yeah, just pop the chain off and just jump off. And they love gold in Southall as well. Yeah, yeah, so they love it. 22, isn't it? Nice 22, yeah. yeah. So we got on that, and then we had the, the, the sun splash, reggae sun splashes. Do you know what I mean? Because I got educated by all the football lot. Right, so we're going to go into that now. So yep. I got into steaming because of the football lot. 1986, all the football lot steamed the reggae sun splash. But the football lot were my older lot from my brother's era. Do you know what I mean? Because so, I used to go Arsenal with all the old lot, and I mentioned it, Andy Gray, and I put you out there, Andy, put it on you a little bit, son. Andy was a, a proper runner for the Gooners, for the Yard, um, and all the others everybody knows, Mark Gay, Paul Gay, fucking Danny Miller, do you know what I mean? Bullet, Tony, like, all, everyone knows, I can reel them off all forever, you know what I mean? My, my closest ones were the ones I've just mentioned, um, growing up with all the, the boys, do you know what I'm saying? So, so was, before we get into football days, talk to us, because when you went to Young Offenders, that was prior to the football days with the gang. Yeah. And how did you get caught then on that steam in the train one and that? How? Because it was just, it's just association, like loads of us getting nicked up. Like, back then, they never had the criminal justice system how they got in now. So if you was black and you was in a certain area, you was fucked. And it was just as simple as that. Were they waiting at the train station for you then? No, we just got, you got nicked. Like, if we went out as a firm, then we was all getting nicked and you get charged for stuff that you never even done. Mm. And if you got picked out on ID parades, you were fucked. And that was how simple it was. So there was so much crime going on at the moment that the police could just pick out for people, put you on ID parade, people pick you out, and you get nicked. That's it, you're fucked. So we'd done so much that it didn't matter what you were getting nicked for because you'd done so much anyway. So you never really, oh, we're, we're, it's an injustice. Well, we're free, we're innocent, we're innocent. Because we know we're not innocent. We're out every fucking day mm. grafting. Do you know what I'm saying? So getting fitted up was just part and parcel of being in that world at that stage of our lives, you know? So you ended up um, going to Young Offenders and obviously you've been in probably little bits of trouble before and not gone there. What was, was there any fear when you actually got the court case and you said, right, you're gone now? Was, what happened that day? fear, man. Like, I remember they said to me, no bail. And I was like, 
What do you mean, no bell? No bell? Well, I'm not going home. Mum! <laughs> mum! Mum! I'd be quiet. I was like, Mum, what are they talking about? I'm not coming home. And they was like, take him down. I'm and like, he give you how long? Nine months, did you Nine say? months, yeah. Nine months. And I'm telling you now, I don't give a fuck what anyone says. Your first time with no bow, if you don't cry, you're a sick individual. So anyone who never cried, you're a proper sick that needs mental help. Because I'm telling you now, I bawled. Especially as a kid, what age are you? 16. 16. Yeah, I cried. I was like, I'm not going home. I'm not going to the shop. I can't go here. I can't. What do you mean? Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to go home. I'm sorry. Tell me, God, tell me. Officer, officer. Can you tell the judge I'm sorry? I'm sorry. I won't do it again. I was like, no, no. I was like, please, please. Begging for my life, mate. Yeah. And then it wasn't until I sort of went to Lambeth holding cells and felt them that I just snapped out of the whinging crying shit, mate. Do you know what I mean? I just, it was like, Pow! you know, you, get, you, you, go, you go court, you come off court, you, then after court you go out of court to the dark and dingy cells and then after the cells you go onto a bus. The bus is like a white coach with 16 cells in it and you just, you just, it's just, it's about that tight and you're sitting in it like that and your feet can't move, there's a door in front of you there, a door there, your knees are there, there's a little window there and you're thinking, wow. And all you can hear is everyone screaming and shouting about what's happening to them. And people don't know each other, they, they're going back and then you hear people getting, I'm gonna fuck you up when we get back here, when we all fuck you up, I'm gonna do this. And you're just thinking, where the fuck am I going? Do you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you pull up, you see this gate open, you go in, next thing you know, they come in, they call you off the bus and they put you in a fucking room with 20 or 30 other little cunts, mate. They all wanna rob ya, all wanna beat ya, all wanna take your shit. And I'll just fall. <clears throat> Here we go. Here we go, mate. And that was it. Do you remember the first time you got tested in the YOs and... From the day you walk in there, in, in my, cause I'd watch scum and things like that. I sort of worked out what I gotta do. And where I weren't a shook member, I was always game to fight, so for me, fighting was just an escape. Do you know what I mean? So if we had a problem, we'd have a fight then, mate. Fuck it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'll have a fight. Fuck it. I finally fight with the four of them. I'll have a fight. Fuck it. So my escape was always having the fight. So as long as I had that escape, I was always all right. Do you know what I mean? So in my head, as long as I'm fighting, I'm all right. So if anyone says anything to me, just punch them straight in the fucking mouth and fight. Just fight. Just fight. Do you know what I mean? That's it. So as soon as I got into the holding cell, it was just fight mode. So it's like, what? 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 Anyone said anything, it's like, what? What are you saying, bro? What? What are you saying, mate? Because that's what you say. Because I used to get called sweet mate. My son used to call me sweet mate, sweet mate. Because that's what I used to say, mate, 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 everything. So it's like, what are you saying, mate? What are you saying, mate? What are you looking at, mate? What do you want, mate? Fuck off, mate. Or they were just constant. So. First walking into, the first challenge was, gives a fag. I said, do I know you? Do I know you? I ain't going to shop in a minute, mate. I don't know when I'm gonna get no more fags. I ain't giving you no fucking fags. I don't know you, mate. He said, but you got 20. I said, I don't give a fuck. I don't know you. And then it's just like, for me, and no one else knows me in here. So the next time someone asks me for a fag, I'm gonna smash them in the mouth. Because that's how my brain thought at that stage. And no one did. Do you know what I mean? But looking back with hindsight now, I was dressed too good. Do you know what I mean? Because I was dressed in, I had a pair of wood ass, I remember it, I had wood ass shoes on, uh, wood ass ankle boots with a buckle. So you had the, the, the boots with a, with a gold buckle, I had a pair of Chevron jeans, I had a Paul Smith shirt on, and a Gant bomber jacket with leather sleeves, cashmere body, and the high collars. So I'm talking about stuff that people are talking about now. Yeah, do you understand? So I look sick, bro. My jacket was about 1,300 quid. Do you know what I mean? My jeans was 200 quid, mm. my shoes were 200 quid. So I was dressed, and I got 20 snap. Do you know what I mean? I got two packets of 20 snap, one open, one shut. So you brought the attention and made yourself a target yeah. as you walked in there? as soon as I walked in, he gives a fag and I was like, I ain't getting a fag, I don't know you. So in my head, if I don't know you, you're getting nothing from me. 
in jail. And if I don't know you, I'm not talking to you. So I'm, I was known as that guy. I was like, hello, mate. I was like, what? Do I know you? What are you chatting to me for? What do you want? Move for me. And if they never moved for me, it was off. And I didn't mind fighting. I didn't mind losing. I never lost a fight yet. So I didn't mind, I didn't mind fighting because I was never thinking about losing. And the crazy thing about the YOs is you actually, that is, the attack is the best form of defence in a place like that because you will get tested. You can't go in a place like that and keep your head down and not get tested. It's, uh, you can. You can, yeah? Of course you can, yeah. You did, didn't you? Not in the YOs, I had in there, you got it. No, but what I'm saying, you, the, the YOs are just a, a, a smaller version of the big man shells. So yeah. you, how you can survive in a big man jail, you'll survive the same in the, in, in the YOs. I thought they were worse now, the YOs. So that, because you ain't been there. Yeah. Right, so... Because the same way you survived in the man jail, mm. you survived in the YOs because you're a benefit. Mm. If you turned up there and you had nothing, you would have had a miserable life in prison. But because you had product that people wanted, you made yourself a benefit. 100%. So you weren't getting a problem. Mm. And as long as you're a benefit in prison or on the road, you ain't gonna have a problem. It's when you become non-beneficial to people is when you're a problem. I mean, when you become a hindrance to people is when you're a problem. When you're a benefit, you're never a problem. You know what I mean? So mm. always make sure you're a benefit in that world, otherwise you're going to be a problem. And that was my game. I always knew how to be everyone's benefit because I got people what they didn't, what, what, what they couldn't get. Do you know what I mean? Like, so what they weren't prepared to do. If you weren't prepared to do something, I'll do it for you, but it'll cost you. Simple, and that was it. And I'll learn how to sell myself young. And that's mm. what I've done throughout the adolescents, even I used to sell, I used to sell carrier bags of weed, cents of me in your weed, like say half a pan, a pan, for like 100, 200 quid. And that was like, back then it would have been about three and a half, four grand a pound. Do you know what I mean? I remember, it was two or three grand a pound, I can't remember. What was that stuff stealing off your dad? Yeah, it's the things I used to nick off my dad. My dad had lockups in it, so I used to burgle the lockups and nick bags of gear off my dad. Yeah, and even when I used to hear him having arguments with his pals, like I hear him, they say, Barry, man, this thing's light up. And he's like, what are you chatting about? Listen, this is what got delivered. There's the money for what got delivered. They say, Barry, nah, man, there's a tree ting light there. There's five ting light there, B. And he's like, I'm telling you now, there ain't nothing light in my gaff. It, what is there is there. And what was there got sold. And what got sold, that's the money for. So if what you brought is light, the money's gonna be light. I'm telling you now, because when my dad was an honorable man, he knows that money was there for the product that was there. What he didn't know, what my dad didn't know, is the product that I was stealing. So he's standing up to all these people for years. So I'd like to put it out there now that my dad wasn't a, a player. My dad didn't pull strokes. I pulled all the strokes and he just didn't know. So I'm sorry. I'm responsible for the money my dad owes. Ah, <laughs> oh, what a blinder. And do you know in that first sentence when you in the YO, did you get starred up on that sentence there, or was it a following one? So you no, went to no, 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 I never got starred up till I was 17, 17, 18. Because the first, the first bit of bird was learning, I found out about my power, my strength, my abilities. And I found out my pain threshold. And then I realised I could take a lot more than most people. So I weren't scared of getting bent up. I weren't scared of getting beaten by the screws. So screws couldn't intimidate me. Yeah, so definitely didn't put you off the life of crime then. No, definitely, no, no, never, no. It just... Built contacts while you are in there and stuff like that? It this. inspired me because all I wanted to do was be better than everybody else. So any environment I went into, as long as I could be better than him and him and him, I'm doing well. So in that environment, I was like, what? what? How much money did you make on the app? What? Shut up. Fuck that. You're shit, bro. Well, you can't do this, you can't do that, because I can make money. Like, even car stereos, right? I know it sounds perfect, but I used to nick £500, £600 a day with car stereos. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that was a lot of money in the 80s. And I was nicking that every day. It's a lot of money today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but in the 80s, money, it's three, then. four times as much as the value today, yeah, right? The money goes. So I was nicking four four to six hundred pounds a day nicking car stereos. And that was only four or five car stereos. And I'd have them by dinner time. Do you understand? And then you go out in the night time. Do you know what I mean? Like, so what we used to do, I used to go out go work before work and then after work. So before you went to work in the morning, I'd be out. Like four to six o'clock in the morning, I'd be out getting car stereos. And then between seven and 12 o'clock at night, I'd be out getting car stereos. 
Because between 7 and 12 o'clock, that's when people rush in their house, when people leaving things in their car. I'll leave it there till the morning. Mm. So all this sort of stuff is what I prepared myself for. So I, I was very intuitive when it came to steaming. So I knew when to make money. And people know me, no, I'm not talking shit because I was having it with 25 year olds when I was 13. And people that know me know, and people that talk about it, it's why I'm making such a, an impact or making, becoming so popular because people say, no, he's right. I remember him. I, I'm a fucking, I, I fucking, I remember him, mate. Was there any particular car you used to target of any particular stereo? No, when we used to nick the cars, because basically what happens, we nick the car stereos, I remember nicking the car stereos, and I'm getting ready to Blair Punt New York, Blair Punt Toronto, Pioneer 9162, 88 or 81, or something like that it was. Um, there was about five or six certain car stereos, and you got them in BMWs um, and Mercedes. The Mercedes used to have a stereo called the Becca Mexico, which we used to get certain money for when we got the packs in the boot. So you got the, the amp, you got the stereo and then the amp. If you got that, then you got 1,100 pound. It's crazy money for these stereos back then. So just getting the stereo itself, you got you between 80 pound and 150 pound. Blair Punt New York got you 150 pound. Blair Punt Toronto, Blair Punt um, Toronto, New York, to and there's all different names for them, but they're the ones I remember, Blair Punt New York and the Toronto, they were the highest ones. Becca Mexico was another one you got, and then all the pioneers, and then the slide outs came. So basically, we'd nick the car stereo, you get four, five, four to six hundred quid a day doing them. And then every now and then, you get um, golf clubs, um, bags, packages, and car keys, and you find the car keys. And then basically, after doing it for a couple of years, we found out that you could take the door handles off golfs and get the key number off the door and then get the keys cut for the car. And in them days, they never had all the mobilizer with the alarms and stuff like that. And then basically, um, getting the the car stereos and then get the keys, knit the keys, knit the cars, and then the cars would sell the cars, chop the cars up, break the cars into bumpers, and that's what went on into the more serious crime because after nicking the cars and the car stereos, we used to give the cars to people over East London. And then they used to give us an order for the cars, BMs, Golfs and Peugeots, right? And then basically we used to get so many cars for them that they couldn't pay us in cash. And then they started giving us Ease and Coke in lieu of the cash. But because we earned more money from the Ease and the Coke, it made sense us getting paid in Ease and Coke. Yeah, you're not so going then, back after that. Yeah, so that's how it started. That's how the initial thing started. Mm. And obviously we plugged into Andy Pritchard's network and they all got nicked for tons of sniff, do you know what I'm saying? So, all the, the growth came as the progression moved up the ladder as we made. And what age was that then when you sort of started touching on the East London lot? 14, 15, 16. Yeah, 14, 15, 16, we was up to a couple of grand a week. Jesus. And um, at these times there, did you start going to the football at these times? I've been going football all the time with all the any where it was football kind of thing with me. When I was youngster, I used to go with the older lot, I used to get dragged along. But then as I got older and I got more violent, more confident, and more known, if I went out raving, and everyone that knows me from the football they know, if I went out raving or went out on a mad one, I want to go football. Because I only went football for ag and violence. I never went football for football. So people that know me know I wasn't a football fan. Yeah. I just come for ag. I just come to make money. So I was just coming to create problems to make money. Because if you've got 200 or 1,000 people running up the street, you can make a few quid that day. Okay. Because so, <laughs> okay. you've got shops, you've got bureau de changes, you've got jewellers, you've got everything. You can just run in and rob them. Do you know what I mean? You get home with a parcel. So that was what my, ben, my goal was going football. And then obviously, because I was young and very game, I made a, an impact in that world with the older lot. So all my friendships come because the older lot sort of see the gameness. And like, I'm, I was just the same as the older lot, really. I had the same heart and drive as the older lot, but I was just younger, that was all. Did you ever travel abroad with Arsenal and that was a... Yeah, yeah. or everywhere. Italy, the, the Europa, Germany. Um, Were they your first trips abroad at that time? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we used to go away, go football, go go do the, we've done all the football stuff, and then we go away, and then after the football, it'd be getting all your weapons. So you go away for the CS gas, the spring-loaded kosh, um, 
flick knives, because you go France and get them all. So mm. we used to go over there. Because it ain't until you realise, with a football, that you can travel without your parents. Do you know what I mean? So then you think, fuck, oh, I'll do that on my own, I'm going on my own. So we used to go over there with like loads of us, like five or six of us, you go over and get loads of flick knives, gas, mm. CS gas, CS spray, flick knives, flick, um, spring loaded coshes, and then come back and sell them all. So we was always travelling and exploring different areas growing up, do you know what I mean? Mm. And so, talk to me about when the crime started getting into the serious organised crime, where you started doing armed robbery, so we started going away from the rushing the football and the training the gang and stuff. But that was just age, right? So all, all the amateur sort of, all the immature behavior, the growing up, the gangs, the violence, that was just getting me prepared for where I was going. So obviously you have to be game. You have to, people have to know you to make an impact. Like when you walk in, what I learned from being a criminal was, <clears throat> When you walk into a place and everybody knows you, yeah, then you've made an impact, right? So my aim and goal was no matter where I want, where I went, everyone knew who I was. And if you didn't, then you're gonna get to know today. And the way I got to get to know everybody and everybody knows me, it wasn't correct, I'm not proud of it, but it was just through violence. So if I come to your gap, if I went to a club in East London for the first time ever and no one knew me in there, by the end of the night, they would know me. Yeah, and that they would have either submitted to me putting it on them or we would have kicked off. And then afterwards they would have spoken and then we would have met up and then people would have just become mates. So yeah, that's how you're allowed to kind of do your criminal apprenticeship in quick time, much quicker than anyone else and just went straight through the levels up into the... Well, it's the same apprenticeship everyone's got, but no one faces. Do you know what I mean? So I put myself through the rigorous apprenticeship because I believed... The quicker people believe who you are, the quicker you can grow, innit? So if everyone thinks you're hard, but you've never had a fight, how hard are you really? Do you know what I mean? So everyone knew I could fight. Everyone knew I could stab. Everyone knew I would shoot. Everyone knew I would rob a van. Everyone knew I'd burgle a house. Everyone knew I'd stab you up. Mm. So it wasn't whether or not I might do stuff. People knew what I'd do. So when I turned up somewhere, they would be like, oh, that's Marv, do you know who he is? Yeah. So I had nicknames. Do you know what I mean? So I was known as Mad Marv. Do you know what I'm saying? So though, Eminem was my nickname growing up until Eminem come out. Because when Eminem come out, because my nickname, my, my, my original name is Marvin Mahoney. So my nickname after Smiley and Deck was Eminem. And then Eminem came out, so I stopped using it. So the Eminem got transferred into Mad Marvin rather than Eminem. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So then it just went, everyone just put me down as a lunatic growing up. It was the easiest way to describe Marvin, and it was the easy out for anyone that had a problem with me. I oh, you know he's a lunatic, fuck him. Oh, don't go, he's mad, he's mad. So it was just an easy out to come into contact with Marv because he's mad, and it's, you're not a mug for backing down from Marv. Mm. You're not a mug. Do you know what I mean? And that was sort of early on. So was it when you got starred up that you made uh, real relationships with older villains and that that allowed you to get into the armed robbery stuff? I just. Was, Learning all the arm robbery stuff came with me emulating the people from the environments I was put in. So when I got started, I went to Brixton and I, and I see all the arm robbers, right? And then I started communicating because I just talk to people. What do you do? What do you get it for? Let me see your paperwork. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I was inquisitive. I was an inquisitive person. Some people used to think I was cheeky, but I just wanted to find stuff out. I wanted to find out why people got nicked. So I don't, I'd like to so say, I would never commit a robbery if I'd been out the night before, or I was on drugs, right? Never. I've never committed a robbery with someone I know can't keep their mouth shut. Right, so I'm gonna put a couple of things on your podcast now as I never put on anyone else's. So you did, you did do one once and it went wrong, but we'll get to that down the line. Right, say that again. You did do one robbery after a night out, but we'll get to that down the line. What I'm saying is the reason yeah. why you learn, right? <clears throat> so reading other people's paperwork, right? So I used to bug up my cars, I used to bug up my houses, and I used to video everything. So if you come to me, if, say, if I can say, Kieran said to me, oh yeah, my pal wants to come and work with you, Marv. I say, yeah, let me meet him. So I was saying to Chris, you know, you get on, yeah, what do you do? What do you want to do? How game are you? What do you like? What do you do? I said, oh, that's sweet to me. So I said, would you mind taking this car? Can you drive? You go, yeah, have you got a license? Yeah, right, take this car, have this car, right? And just use this car to come and see me. Don't use this car for anything else, but when you come to this place, you come in that car. You don't have no one in that car and you don't talk in that car, right? 
You say, yeah, right, sweet, 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 sweet. But what you don't know is that car's got a built-in camera, got a built-in recorder, and it's got a built-in tracker. Do you understand? So I know where you are, who you talk to, and who you got in my car. Right? After two weeks, if I'm not happy with how you conduct yourself, I'll just make an excuse mm. on why I can't be around you. But I'll never let you know that I know what you've done. Do you understand? But people that know me know I'm the man of counter surveillance, and people know that I listen mm. and I watch and I make sure. Yeah. Because that's what I've always done from a kid. Because I'm not making the same mistakes that the geezers made who were doing 25 years on the unit. Do you understand? Like I've been around all these people at this stage, so I'm not making them mistakes. I've listened to what people what got people nicked. Yeah, laying down, telling birds what they got up to telling people what they're doing, telling people what they're planning. Like, why would you do that? So I learned very young, just keep, sink, loose lips sink ship. So tell no one nothing unless they're coming on the work. And then that happened once and it fucked up. So after that fuck up, what I started doing was I'd find the work, I'd find the routes, I'd execute it, and then I'd get my team in place once the execution's in place. So they'll say, do you want to go out work? You say, I need you to drive. I need you to what say? I need you to deliver something. You do it, yeah. So I'll give you a job, a specific job. So you'd have to be, I'll say to you, I want you to take some money. I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna give you a couple of bags. I need you to take the bag somewhere, take all the sh all the money out of the bags and put all the plastic in another bag. Can you do that? Yeah, I'll give you five or 10 grand to do that. Well, I need you to take these guns. I need you to take these guns to this place. Can you do that? You get five grand to do that. Um, so you take this car and you take this car and you put it out, you get five grand to do that. Not a problem. So I'll pick you up one day and say, right, well, you got five grand, you got five grand, you got five grand. You, got, you ready? Right, you go and sit in your places. Next thing you know, I turn up, give you a bag, you drive off. I turn up, I'll give you a car, you drive off. I turn up, I'll give you a gun, you drive off. And then I'll get into another car and I'll go about my business. Do you understand? So everyone got paid for their job on the day. Um, and I just made sure that no one ever knew what I was doing. So I never got nicked. Mm. And that was just rules that I put into my processes growing up. That if you want to come and work with me, then you come and work with me. Because I'm not doing a bit of work that you're going to give me. Because I watch too many people go and work and get nicked. So I'm not going to take a work off someone else and get nicked. And then they say, I didn't know. When really and truly, you take work off someone else and get nicked, you've been set up. So I wouldn't do that. So I found all my own work, I employed my own um, team members and we executed the work. Mm. And so with the targets always security vans or I don't want you to cremate no, yourself to go to banks or anything? Anything that made money You're yeah, right. or anything that was worth money, I took it. I would never rob people, but I robbed <clears throat> I robbed the SA offices. So where where gold gets certified, right? It's called an SA office, right? So it goes there and it gets his watermark. Mm -hmm. Right. But they've got to deliver gold to there that hasn't been SA'd. And they've got to take gold away from there that has been essayed. So you've got win-win. Right? That so what you do... How much you get? It's all, it all varies. So, it, <clears throat> so you've got people that are delivering the gold that hasn't been done. Right? That's untraceable, undetectable, and some of it's shit. But you can get that and go and smell it yourself or sell it yourself or wait for them to... You know, you can, whatever you rob, whether it's coming or going, it's, it's good. But it's better when it's going. Do you mm. know what I mean? Because it's been essayed, it's worth X amount of money. It's 18 carat. It's, if it's going in and it hasn't been essayed, it might be 14 carat, 12 carat, or some shit carat, and they've got to make it up to 18 carat or 24 carat. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it <clears throat> depends on the quality of gold going in, which is what you learn. So it's always best with the gear coming out. But the good thing about the gear going in, what you could do was take the number plates of the people that are delivering it and then follow them home. And then you find the houses where the gaffs are that's getting the gear delivered. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's just about due diligence, right? How much due diligence are you going to put into making money? So we made money out of nicking gold, diamonds, and money. Mm. And that was it. I never done anything else. So anything that nicked gold, diamonds, and money, I was involved in. So at these times there, you'd really sort of crime the criminal lad, you're earning decent money. Um, was there ever any sort of feuds going on between rival criminals or other people at these it times? Don't stop. Was it... it don't stop. It don't stop. It don't stop. So I've had feuds all the way through my life with everyone from North London, East London, West London, South London. I've had it with Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle and Glasgow. So at that stage there, so sorry, obviously I know when drugs come in later on you can understand why there's territorial sort of stuff, but at that time there when you're just doing your own targets, what were the feuds over and stuff like this at that time, just do you remember? bullies. 
people take liberties with other people, people, like, I never had any problems. This is the irony of my life. I never had any problems, but I was a loyal friend that got involved in a lot of problems for other people. So I just retaliated for a lot of people and helped people retaliate themselves and then got tired with the same brush. So I never had any personal anger with anybody. There ain't anybody out there can say, oh, me and Marvin have had anger because of X, Y, Z, Marvin done. Do you know what I mean? People have been, I've reacted to people's behaviours and I've hurt people for taking liberties. Do you know what I mean? But I've never had any anger with people because I've took a liberty for nothing. Yeah, you fight your friends sort of battles at those, that time there. Yeah, even my friends. I've, I've, some of my friends have been shot, some of my friends have been stabbed, and some of my friends have been beaten up. But that's because they broke the rules. And that was the mindset I had back then. Do you know what and, I'm saying, John? And how did that make you feel, having to hurt your friend? It's I all felt bad, but fuck it, man. What? What? You let me down, bro. I'll give you an example. Right, one kid, we was doing a bit of work, and one kid ran off and nearly got my mate nicked. What are you going to do with him? Do you know what I mean? And he got in the car, he got in the car after with us to, as if we we're going to have a, a, a laugh and a giggle. And I was like, you just nearly got my mate killed, mate. What is the matter with you? He said, no, he's all right, he's all right. I said, he's all right, because I was there. I saved the day, you cunt. So I smashed his teeth in. Do you know what I mean? I said, speed the fucking car up. He put his foot down, I just threw him out of the car. The fucking cunt. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you take liberties, you, you're, you're, off, you're off shit, mate. That's it. At the end of your relationship with him, he obviously didn't come in any more jobs. Yeah, I bumped, in, I bumped into him. I bumped into him uh, three years later. He was doing. A, I think he got twenty-five years for sh killing someone, and I bumped into him in uh, Swellside. And I won't expose him, but um, yeah, I bumped him in Swellside. And he was like, Whoa. I said, "No, you was a mug, mate. How are you doing that?" So I mean, he got given a job to do, right? And he never done it. And he expected to get in the car with us after and sp split the profit. Nah, mate. No, 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 no. Friends have let me down in the past. Do you know what I mean? Friends have... have uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about me. No, of course. So you talk about... Um, obviously, feuds have started beginning and happen there. You'd have to commit acts of violence. But when was the first time you were seriously hurt, Marvin? Like, what effect did that have on you? Any... Like, some serious violence that happened to you? Um... The, the violent ag, the first ag was that one. See that there? So I got stabbed in my heart, right? I got stabbed in my heart over a feud that went on for a couple of years in North London. I won't mention no one's names, but everyone will know who I'm talking about when I talk about it. So basically, feuds start over the most pathetic of things. So one of my friends sold a couple of the kids, or a couple of the kids around our way, a couple of Fantasia tablets. Now Fantasia were called Fantasia because they was a little bit trippy. Right? There wasn't a the conventional weed. They was a little bit strong and a little bit wilder. But they were trippy. So these kids bought a couple of these off my mate. They didn't like them because they were trippy. So they've gone back to my mate and wanted a refund. My mate said, do yourself a favour and jog. Because they were £25 a pill back then. right? So they was like, no, we want our money back. We want our money back. He's like, what are you talking about? You've had a pill, mate. You're buzzing. Piss off. They're sweet as a nut. So they've got the ump now because they think he's, they've been knocked because they think they got sold a trip, right? So then when they got around my mate's house and they beat my mates, beat my mate up and then spat in his mum and dad's, or in his mum's face, then went around another one of my mate's houses, put a brick through the window, terrorised his mum and dad, and then beat up one of my pals with his missus and put her in hospital. Do you know what I mean? It was just like, what the fuck are these lot doing? So then basically, um, the feud started tit for tat stuff and then, Better, 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 better. What happened? What happened? What happened? Um, see, there might have been two stages of this scenario because it's just come to me now because I thought the geezer that stabbed me was was it before or after? Because right, so I've seen this guy. That he was like the head of the little gang. So I'm driving through the Crescent, I've seen him in the chip shop. So I've jumped out of the car, I've run in the chip shop. So I've run in the chip shop and I've started trying to stab him. But he had a really long, I think it was a Paul Smith overcoat on. And where I'm trying to stab him, he's jumping backwards. So I'm stabbing the coat and not realising I'm not stabbing him, I'm stabbing the coat, but I didn't realise, I thought I was stabbing him. <clears throat> so then I've stabbed him about 12, 14 times and then just come out of the, chip shop. I never even bothered looking at him because I thought he's fucked. 
So I run back to the car. There's no blood on the car, so I've put the car, the blade somewhere. And all of a sudden, I've heard him behind me. I've turned around and went, come on then, come on then. And I was like, what the fuck? And he's pulled out a sword. And I was like, wow, well, come on then, come on then. And he's like, Whoa. I see. and then basically he's got the sword there like that. And I wasn't a coward as a kid, so I just run at him. And we just, as, as I run at him, I try to stab him. And as I try to stab him, he stabbed me like that. And then I felt it go in and I've just tried to cut him and it never happened. And then I sort of pulled away because it was kind of hurting a little bit. And as I pulled away, he's run. And that's when I've gone like that and it's just all fucking opened up. So then I've chased him, chased him. I got him in the house. He's running the house. I boot the door off of the house, run through the house, run up the stairs. He's dived out of a window. I've run out of the house. I've chased him a bit more. And then I started getting woozy um, because I've loads, loads, lost loads of blood. Um, and then one of my mates come, we got a towel, I wrapped that around me, and we drove around for about half hour, 40 minutes looking for him, couldn't find him. And then um, I went to the hospital, got stitched up. I think a couple of days later, I've seen him again. And I've seen him. So when I've seen him, I've caught off, I've got this cunt now. And it, cause he could run. He could run this kid. He was fast as you like. He was one of the fastest kids in the school. But you know when you got that, I'm going to kill you. Was he one of your cunt. schoolmates, was he? Or we, we, went to the same school? Right, we all grew up, to, everyone I talk about, I've grown up with everyone. Oh, Do you yeah. Everything goes back to yeah. my childhood. Close stuff, right? yeah. Right. So you said you want to talk about my first serious ag. Yep. This was my first serious ag. Yep. Right? So basically, I've seen him. I thought, there he is, the cunt. I'm going to do him. So I've got him. I've chased him, chased him. And this, this kid was the fastest kid in Queen's Crescent. I'll guarantee you, right? So I'm chasing him, chasing him, chasing him, and I've got him. I've got right behind him, I've kicked his back foot and he's fell over. So I've got him, I'm on top of him now. So now I can kill him. So I'm on top of him. And I just said to him, listen, mate, listen, tell me if you want it. Tell me if you want it. If you want it, you can have it. If you don't want it, you get up and you fuck off. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. Do you understand me? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I said, do you want it? He said, no. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. I said, I'm telling you now, if you get up and anything happens, I'll fucking come to your house. I'll kill you. I'll kill your brother. I'll kill your family. I'm telling you. Yeah, and he went, I'm, 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 I don't want it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, all right, sweet, go up. And I'll give him his due. He got up and that day he left the manor. I, I haven't seen that kid since. Anyway, no, I'm telling you a lie. I did see him after that. I did see him after that. Because what happened was, that was summer times, so then, yeah, this is where all the ag started. This was it now, 17, 18. So that all, that, all that was kicking off with this little mob in the manor, having tit for tat. It was out raving, fighting, kicking off with everybody all around London, just giving it the ego bit. And then, <clears throat> this is what really catapulted me, I believe, because this is what brought me to the attention of all the older lot. So now, we're having this tit for tat with these younger lot our age. And then one day I'm driving down um, Chalk Farm and one of my pals has flagged me down in the car and he's gone, Marv, Marv, them lot are in there, you know, in the roundhouse. The roundhouse is a theater in Chalk Farm, but I used to do illegal raves in there before it was all done up. So I said, oh, they, well, them lot are in there. I said, who? He said, all of them. Blah, 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 blah. I said, shut up. He said, yeah. So I rung my two pals and I said, blah, blah, you, have you got the pneumonia? He said, yeah. I said, you got, I said, yeah, so get the ammonia and get a blade, get the bat and come meet me. We're at the round house here in the street. So the plan was that I had the baseball bat, my skinny little mate had the ammonia, and my other mate had the blade. So while well, I said with the geese with the ammonia, he's the skinniest one of all. I said, you walk in there, <clears throat> because back then you used to wear, wear bandanas in the raves, everyone wore bandanas and caps. So you, you could walk through the bandana calling it acid, acting like a dickhead, and I want to pay attention to you. So he's walked in with a bandana on, blah, 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 got in front of the firm, and he's done the whole firm with ammonia. And everyone who knows with ammonia knows you can't breathe. You can't even, you can't breathe, you can't see. So as he's done that, I've run in and I've targeted the four main people we need. Right? So I've done boom, boom, boom. And I've got to put this out there because Josephine, right? Josephine, the young, beautiful Josephine, I'm so sorry. And I was sat publicly because you know, because I've spoken to you and you know how sorry I am for this. But any of your friends 
I have to know that I'm truly sorry because it was an accident and I did not mean it in any way, shape or form. Because as I've gone in to crack the head of one of these cunts, I've gone in, I've gone crash, crash, crash. And then the, the, the biggest one of all of them, you know when you just take a deep breath, I've gone, and I've got to do him, and, I've gone, and as I've pulled the bat back to crack him in his face, I didn't know at the time, but I've done that, and I've smashed the life out of this geezer, put him on the floor, I've done split my mate's bird out of open, wide open, like, split her whole head open, mate. Do you know what I mean? But she was behind us, not involved, but I caught her by accident, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, and she was a beautiful young thing, and I could have had the potential to ruin her whole life if that had been down the front of her face, do you know what I'm saying? So I'm truly sorry about that, because at the time I did not know, and knowing that, I can't wait to see you to give you a big cuddle and let you know how much I really do feel that, man. Because putting a scar on someone is the worst thing in the world, really. But um, yeah, so that happened. And then after that, basically they've all been put down. So then we've got the ones that we need. So then they've been plunged up. Because I've done, I put them down and then my pal plunged them up. So basically the ammonia, the bat, the plunging, they've been served, that's it. So they got left in the heap, we left. So boom, we've gone. Now I've gone, now we're buzzing because we've just done the whole firm. We've just done the, fir the rival firm we're having ag with. You got to say, we're only 15, 16, 17. Like, we've just done their firm, right? The whole lot of them, weighed them in, right? And that was when the other kid, he left after that and never come back. And he was the hardest one out of all of them. Um, yeah, so now we're buzzing. We're, yes, 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 we've done this, mob. But what we didn't know, was one of the kids had powerful uncles from East London that had a firm, right? So we didn't give a fuck about anyone. So one night, one of the older lot have come in the pub one night with some geezer and they're trying to talk to my mate. So I said, what's going on, what's going on? So oh, this is Blah Blah's uncle. I said, what do you want? He's like, my nephew, my nephew, my nephew. I said, mate, what's the problem, mate? I said, we're having this kid stuff. What the fuck's it got to do with you? Why are you coming down here? Do so you want to go and speak to your nephew, mate? Do you know what I mean? Because if your nephew comes within arm's reach, he's getting plunged up, mate. I don't give a fuck what you got to say. Do you know what I'm saying, sir? So I'll go and speak to your nephew because they've took a fucking liberty over two E's, mate. Fucking mugs. Do you know what I mean? So my argument was, you've made such a drama over two pills. Walk away. It's fucking 50 pounds, you mugs. Do you know what I'm saying, sir? Now you've devastated so many people's lives and fucking livelihoods. And now you're still c continuing. Why? Do you know what I mean? Wind your neck in. Your, your nephew's a mug, mate. Anyway, cut a long story short. Um, he was like, whoa, 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 like trying to give it a big one. But I said, mate, this is kid stuff. What? You coming down here to do what? I said, how about I go and get a man your way to come and deal with you? Because I've got older brothers and cousins and everyone, right? So I said, all right, sweet, no problem. I'll go and see. I said, I said you know my old man. You know my old man. Because the kids, he'd come down. I said, go and speak to my dad, you mug. Do you know what I mean? Fucking bringing other men down here to speak to me. Go and speak to my dad. Do you know what I mean? Because they all used to get laid on gear by my dad. Mm. So anyway, that's gone away. After that incident in the pub that night, that was in the Monarch in, on uh, Ferdinand Street, about coming up to Christmas it was. Now all the older, older lot from the West End that do all the drugs and all the badness, right? They were my dad's pals, right? So I got invited to a Christmas party in a theatre called the Beerzhu Theatre. Now, you won't have heard about it because you wouldn't have been at that level, but the Beerzhu Theatre was a, a viewing for a viewing room for the Warner Brothers, right? So it's a very pretentious party where the heads of Warner Brothers and all these Saatchi and Saatchi and Warner Brothers, it was, right? It's their viewing rooms for the latest coming movies but they do parties, like exclusive parties. So I'm in there with my ex bird and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting down, blah, blah, getting on it. All of a sudden I've seen this geezer walk in, who was the uncle of this firm we was having it with. And he's walked in, I went, sweetheart, is that such and such? She went, yeah. I went, shut up, what's he doing here? So I've keep my eyes on him now. All of a sudden he's clocked, scanning, he's clocked me. So as he's looking at me, I just thought, go on, say something, bro, say something. Say same, say same. And with that, he's leaned over to my mate, my dad's mate. He's leaned over to my, my dad's mate, Paul, and said, 